We are in the book of Ezra and the whole mission thus far is to rebuild the house or temple of God that was destroyed by the Babylonians. It's a God given mission. God stirred the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, to tell the people of God to go up to Jerusalem to rebuild his house. Then he stirred the exiles to return to do the work. In the last chapter, they set up the altar and began offering burnt offerings to God. And they started work on the temple and laid the foundation. That moment when the foundation was laid inspired praise among the people. They celebrated and gave thanks to God. But it also brought about weeping as the older men who had seen Solomon's temple knew this one is not going to be as magnificent. Let's see what happens next. I'm in Ezra chapter four, verse one, reading from the New American Standard Version. Now, when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the people of the exile were building a temple to the Lord God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of father's households and said to them, let us build with you. For we, like you, seek your God. And we have been sacrificing to him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us up here. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of father's households of Israel said to them, You have nothing in common with us in building a house to our God, but we ourselves will together build to the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. You can count on it every time. When you get about the business of doing God's work, the enemy will try to interfere. And we don't have to wonder, well, maybe they mean well because it tells us that they are their enemies. When we think about the five W's and an H and we say, who is this? These are enemies. And you know they've been watching. They saw the exiles return. They've seen them gathering at the site of the old temple, rebuilding the altar, offering sacrifices. But now we know what a big deal it was for them to lay that foundation. Soon as they did that and started celebrating, here comes the enemy. But how interesting is this? They're enemies, but their first tactic is let us build with you. For we, like you, seek your God. We've actually been sacrificing to him. This brings to mind 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15, where Paul says, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder. For even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. Why would Satan disguise himself as an angel of light and his servants as servants of righteousness? Because so often it works. In a situation like this, for the sake of unity, or maybe just to get some extra hands to help, the people of God could say, you know what? Why quibble? They say they believe as we do. Who are we to judge? We can work toward a common goal and get this temple built. What could it hurt? Meanwhile, servants of God have partnered with servants of the evil one, and that ain't never gonna work. Praise God that Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the other leaders saw the deception for what it was and told them boldly, no, you have nothing in common with us in building a house to our God. Just as these people have been watching the exiles, surely Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the others have been watching them. They know they don't worship the same God. They may have even thought, this is what got our people exiled to begin with, commingling the worship of our God with other forms of worship, which only amounts to idolatry. They weren't building any old house. They were building God's house. Instead of compromising and trying to find commonality to make it work, they said you have nothing 
in common with us in building this house to our God. Look at 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. How on point is that? They were building the temple of God. We are the temple of God. How do we regard these verses? Do we even consider these verses? So often we see unity in the world on the basis of political affiliation, culture, and the like. Are we counting ourselves in unity with others based on a worldly affiliation? In Christ, our unity is in the spirit. Ephesians 4.3 These verses in 2 Corinthians tell us that from God's perspective, there are two groups of people, believers and unbelievers. Other synonyms are given righteousness and lawlessness, light and darkness, Christ and Belial, the temple of God and idols. Do we see as God sees? Are we in harmony with him in this? Do we stand like Zerubbabel and Jeshua and say, we have nothing in common with you when it comes to the work of God, the will of God and the plan of God. We're not trying to find compromise and commonality with you when it comes to the work of God, the will of God and the purpose of God. Or do we compromise? not wanting to offend, not wanting to be persecuted for standing with Christ. Lord, strengthen us to walk in our identity with Christ and to remain steadfast in who we are in Christ. Continuing verse four, then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and frightened them from building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their counsel all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. The first tactic didn't work. Now we see their true intention. Remember the exiles who returned were already terrified of the people in the land. Now they are being actively discouraged and frustrated in the mission God gave them. The people of the land have even hired counselors to frustrate their counsel. Not just for a day or a few weeks, this is ongoing. It says all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the time of Darius. Before we continue verses six through 23, take us to a different time period. Verse five says God's people were frustrated from the time of Cyrus, even until the reign of Darius. The verses after that are considered a parenthetical where Ezra is giving more evidence as to how the people in the land frustrated God's people. It's like, let me tell you what else they did. And he moves to a time period of two kings who came later. I want to note that now so it won't be too confusing. So verse six says, now in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. That's another example of how they frustrated their work. Verse seven begins to detail another instance. Continuing verse seven, and in the days of Artaxerxes, Bishlam, Mithridath, Tabil, and the rest of his colleagues wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And the text of the letter was written in Aramaic and translated from Aramaic. Rehum, the commander, and Shimshai, the scribe, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to King Artaxerxes as 
follows. Then wrote Rehum, the commander, and Shimshai, the scribe, and the rest of their colleagues, the judges, and the lesser governors, the officials, the secretaries, the men of Eric, the Babylonians, the men of Susa, that is, the Elamites, and the rest of the nations, which the great and honorable Osnapper deported and settled in the city of Samaria and in the rest of the region beyond the river. Now, this is the copy of the letter which they sent to him. To King Artaxerxes, your servants, the men in the region beyond the river, and now let it be known to the king that the Jews who came up from you have come to us at Jerusalem. They are rebuilding the rebellious and evil city and are finishing the walls and repairing the foundations. The opposition is not just from random people who live in the land. These are people in high position. Verse 10 gives the list of people represented in sending this letter. Verse 10 says the list of people represented in sending this letter includes the rest of the nations which the great and honorable Osnapper deported and settled in the city of Samaria. Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. After it was conquered by Assyria, the Assyrians brought other people into the land. Many believe the people opposing them here in Ezra's time are the same people who would later be called Samaritans in Jesus' time on earth. Notice verse 12 says they are rebuilding the rebellious and evil city and are finishing the walls and repairing the foundations. This is later in time, after the temple has been built. The focus of this letter is on the city and on the rebuilding of the walls which happened during Nehemiah's time. Continuing verse 13, Now let it be known to the king that if that city is rebuilt and the walls are finished, they will not pay tribute, custom, or toll, and it will damage the revenue of the kings. Now, because we are in the service of the palace and it is not fitting for us to see the king's dishonor, therefore we have sent and informed the king, so that a search may be made in the record books of your fathers. And you will discover in the record books and learn that that city is a rebellious city and damage to kings and provinces and that they have incited revolt within it in past days. Therefore that city was laid waste. We inform the king that if that city is rebuilt and the walls finished, as a result you will have no possession in the province beyond the river. The argument to King Artaxerxes is that it is not in his best interest to let this work proceed. And it's based on a couple of accusations, one related to the past and the other related to the present. First, they say it's a rebellious and evil city that has incited revolt in the past. They say that's why the city was laid waste. Interesting accusation because in the past, Kings of Judah did rebel. For example, 2 Kings 24, 1 and 2 says this, In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim, he was king of Judah at the time, became his servant for three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. So the king of Judah is rebelling against the king of Babylon. He's saying, I'm not going to serve you anymore, which is the type of thing that they're talking about in this letter in the book of Ezra. But look at the next verse. The Lord sent against him, meaning against the king of Judah, who was a wicked king, bands of Chaldeans, bands of Arameans, bands of Moabites, and bands of Ammonites. So he sent them against Judah to destroy it, according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken through his servants, the prophets. The same thing happened with the next king, King Zedekiah of Judah. He rebelled against the king of Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar came in and destroyed the city. But here's the issue. The accusation letter in Ezra says they're known for being rebellious and inciting revolt and therefore the city was laid waste. 
That was not the therefore. They only had an earthly understanding as to why the city was laid waste. It was their rebellion against God that caused the city to be destroyed. Babylon couldn't have done anything to them if God's hand of protection had still been upon them. Here's something else. If the people of Israel had walked in obedience to God, they wouldn't have had to worry about serving any other nation. They were supposed to be the head, not the tail. Other nations were supposed to serve them and pay them tribute. That was one of the blessings God promised them in Deuteronomy 28 if they obeyed him. We see this blessing during the reign of King David. Here's an example in 1 Chronicles 18, 1 through 6. Now, after this, it came about that David defeated the Philistines and subdued them and took Gath and its towns from the hand of the Philistines. He defeated Moab and the Moabites became servants to David, bringing tribute. David also defeated Hadadezer, king of Zobath, as far as Hamath, as he went to establish his rule to the Euphrates River. David took from him 1,000 chariots and 7,000 horsemen and 20,000 foot soldiers. And David hamstrung all the chariot horses, but reserved enough of them for 100 chariots. When the Arameans of Damascus came to help Hadadezer, king of Zobah, David killed 22,000 men of the Arameans. Then David put garrisons among the Arameans of Damascus, and the Arameans became servants to David, bringing tribute. And the Lord helped David wherever he went. Those days were long gone. Because of their disobedience, God's people came under subjection to other nations, which is their plight here in Ezra. They're back home, but under the authority of Persia. The accusation related to the present is this. Their accusers are saying if the city is rebuilt, they will not pay tribute, custom, or toll. And that will damage the revenue of the king. This was an unfounded accusation. The people were not planning to rebel. Continuing verse 17, Then the king sent an answer to Rehum, the commander, to Shimshai, the scribe, and to the rest of their colleagues who live in Samaria and in the rest of the provinces beyond the river peace. And now the document which you sent to us has been translated and read before me. A decree has been issued by me and a search has been made and it has been discovered that that city has risen up against the kings in past days. That rebellion and revolt have been perpetrated in it. That mighty kings have ruled over Jerusalem governing all the provinces beyond the river and that tribute, custom, and toll were paid to them. It's as if he's saying, we conducted a search and found out there were mighty kings there who were the head and not the tail. So now issue a decree to make these men stop work, that this city may not be rebuilt until a decree is issued by me. Beware of being negligent in carrying out this matter. Why should damage increase to the detriment of the kings? Then as soon as the copy of King Artaxerxes' document was read before Rehum and Shimshai the scribe and their colleagues, they went in haste to Jerusalem to the Jews and stopped them by force of arms. The letter from King Artaxerxes said to issue a decree to stop the work. They went immediately and stopped them by force of arms. That's the end of that section that took us forward in time. Here's the last verse, verse 24. Then work on the house of God in Jerusalem ceased, and it was stopped until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So that should be read as the continuation of verse Five. As a result of the discouragement, frustrated counsel, and fear of the people, work on the house of God stopped.
I don't know about you, but I can identify with this. Sometimes the faith journey can seem like a roller coaster. They were stirred up to leave life in Babylon and return to Jerusalem for this express purpose to rebuild God's house. They build the altar. They've got burnt offerings morning and evening. Worship unto God back on track. They lay the foundation of the temple and they're celebrating and praising and giving God thanks. They had to be thinking, let's go. Let's get this done. They even stood firm against their enemies who tried to fake join them. But they couldn't withstand the constant opposition, the discouragement, the frustration, the fear. We don't see them seeking God on this. They succumb to the pressure and stop the very work that God sent them there to do. Discouragement, frustration, fear, they can be hard to overcome. The enemy can be relentless in pouring it on as he was here in Ezra. But this is when we need to cling. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. When discouragement, fear, and frustration hit, run to the Lord and sit in his presence. Tell him the worries of your heart. Unload your cares. There is ministry in his presence. Run to his word and encourage yourself with verses like Psalm 27, 1 through 3. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. Psalm 28, 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart exults and with my song, I shall thank him. 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power, love, and discipline. Psalm 3, 3. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the one who lifts my head. He won't let you stay discouraged. He will lift your head. We need to say like Job after God basically told him in over 100 verses, do you know who I am? Job said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Do you believe that? That God can do all things and that no purpose of his can be thwarted? That's the faith we need to stand on. Sometimes we have to fight to cling to God, but oh, God will be faithful to fight the battle for you. Run to him, run to his word, he will strengthen you. When we are clinging, his strength is perfected in our weakness.